Is that on? Oh, hi. Yeah, it's on. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Martin Harvey, author, illustrator, and uh, creator of the story The Squiggy Pete and the Curse of the Monster Zombie Mushy Peas Invasion Apocalypse Thingy, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, you might have seen me around uh, appearing as this character. Arr, Squiggly Peter! Wah, shiver me timbers! Ha ha ha! Say arr! But, um, it's me, really. OK, now, today um, you've seen part one of this bit, series of videos. Um, in this part two, um, as you know, I'm the author of this book. Um, it's very nearly finished, and I wanted to add a few more characters, some local people, actually into the book. Now, I'll give you an example of the sort of thing that's going on. Here's a page where there's plenty of action and there's plenty of characters and uh, bats and all sorts of things in there for kids to look at. But on some of the pages, I've just got the main characters and there's space for a few more people. So um, in this episode, I'm going to show you, you're talking about how I sp approached my friends at the Red Lion pub. Huh, got it right. In Parkgate and um, took some photographs and made some sketches. And in this episode, I'm going to show you how I get from a sketch such as this. So a finished painting such as this, that's the landlord, John, and how I scan it and actually pop it into the um, into Photoshop, make up the full page uh, ready for sending off to the printers when the book goes off. OK, so that's what I'm going to do today. But before I get into that, I showed you a little bit of that map of uh, Parkgate and the Wirral in the last episode. I thought we'd go for a little deep dive into this. Here's the map in its, in its entirety. If you just follow me in. We'll just go and have a look at some of the features in there. OK, so the map stretches from Blackpool up there down to the Wirral and touches on the River Dee as well. But here we have the busy docks, the River Mersey and Liverpool there with the Liver building and Radio City Tower in the background there. You might recognise one or two of those buildings. And moving down on the map, we've got a few local places. Obviously, Neston is very much in the book, so we've got a little bit there, a little cameo of Neston. Same with Heswell. Heswell's in there as well. And um, here we are in the map of Parkgate itself, starting with the boat house. And then we've got the old customs house, the watch house there, with its steps down to the road. The wreck of the high sea boat there, which everybody knows. And oh my goodness, it's the uh, West Kirby Kraken, which not many people know, um, actually lives in the sea just off um, the mouth of the River Dee and sometimes makes its way up the marshes. Anyway, um, there's what used to be salty. There's um, School Lane, which is where the author used to live. Um, Mostyn Square, the church, little telephone box, a sample of houses on the front, and there's the chip shop. We can't get everything in, of course, so you'll notice I've skipped the red line in this in this instance. Um, the ice cream shop, Nichols, which is obviously very popular with the children, and the ship inn is there, nice place to go. And of course Mostyn House itself, with a few seagulls perched on the roof there, looking down on what's going on. Oh, and then we've got Squiggly Pete and his crew. Little Jack and Lucy Lou dropping in. And of course, as you know, Parkgate's 202 miles from London. And um, there we have Station Road leaving out of Parkgate and up into Neston. And there's Station Road and uh, Dover Cottage, I believe it's called, where Lady Hamilton stayed. And uh, the cottage next to it where the name Nelson is etched out in pebbles. OK, so that's the map. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, no. Let's get into a little bit more detail, shall we? As I say, this is the cover of the book, all nicely finished. And on the back, we've got the Liver building with uh, our friend, the Prime Minister there, looking up at the rocket going off into the sky. OK, and there's lots of fun in here. This is my working copy. This is what I keep on my desk and it's covered with my scribbles because uh, I have new ideas all the time, and things I want to pop in. Oh, there's the monster mushy pea machine making all the mushy peas. Now, some of the most of the pictures are, are there's lots of lots of characters, plenty of action, lots of things going on. Some places still, uh, I think, need a little bit more 
of interest in them. And I showed you this sequence of two pages here, two double page spreads. This is where the mushy peas explode from the chip shop and start pouring down the street. There's an avalanche of um, mushy peas everywhere. Shall I read you a little bit? As they rushed to the street to find out what it was, they could hardly believe their own eyes. From the rooftops was rising a great glob of green, and then peas fell like rain from the skies. "'Tis the end of the world!' Squiggly Peter exclaimed. "'Oh, we've got a volcano!' said Jack. Even Lucy, who rarely expressed such alarm, said that maybe the skies had a crack. There were peas on the pavement, peas on the porch, on the patio, peas pelted down. There were peas in the gutters, and peas in the street. There were peas in each part of the town. "'I've a feeling,' said Lucy, observing this scene, "'things are getting quite rapidly worse.' "'You are right,' muttered Pete. "'We are definitely caught in some monstrous... Mushy P. Curse! Dun dun da. And that's the end of part one, okay? And I've got little part, um, part one and part two breaks just to give parents or teachers or the kids themselves a, a breather when they're reading it. And I'll tell you a little secret. There's lots of little historical things and literary references in here. Anyone spot what famous poem this page relates to? I'll give you a clue. I'll read the text. Peas, peas everywhere, and still no fish and chips. So I'm not very good at making the sound of an albatross. Right, okay, so there's loads of little things built in there, which as you, as kids grow older, they'll discover and go, oh, that's why that page was like that. Anyway, I won't waffle on. Let's have a look at some of the detail, shall we? Um, and I'll just explain an overview of what I wanted to do. As I said, if I can find that page again quickly, I'm going to have to get good at this, aren't I? Here we go. So there's the centre of Park Gate, the parade, when the peas explode, the red line right in the middle of Park Gate. And as you can see, there's this bit of space here, and I've got the main characters, but I wanted to get some more characters in. And I thought, do you know what? I need like a group of people stood outside the pub like that. Just come out to see what all the commotion's about and this is the sort of thing I do. I make a little sketch like that to give myself an idea, a reminder, then very often I'll just actually cut it out or photocopy it and reduce it in size and cut it out and stick it in the picture just to see how it works. So there you've got a few more characters. Obviously that's just a quick idea. And then I went down to the red line and spoke to John, the landlord there, and the staff, and said, would you like to be involved in this book as cartoon characters? And they went, oh yes, we love that, that's great. Um, and I'm going to be approaching some more people to see if they want to get involved as well. I'll tell you more about that at the end of the video. Um, and um, then we took some photographs. I'll probably put them up here. There we go. So you can see the sort of thing we were doing, the fun we had. We had to stop the traffic. Um, and then um, from those photographs, I made these sketches uh, like this sort of thing. Now these are photocopies because in the other episode, or no, in this episode actually, I'm going to show you how I sometimes I often photocopy the drawings, put them on a light box, which is a thing artists use to, you know, for tracing purposes. It puts light behind this, and then you could put paper on top of it and trace it. Um, and then how I paint that up with my watercolor paints and get to a finished piece of art like this. Now, as you can see in this picture, I've got light green bright green all down one side because it's the reflection of the light from the mushy peas. So you've got to think of these things. So there's uh, John, landlord of the pub. I know it doesn't look exactly like him, but um, that doesn't really matter because it's basically just an idea of turning real characters that local people will recognise and go, oh, that's supposed to be John from the pub. So um, that's, that's the fun of this. So there we go. Um, so I'm going to be showing you how I work it up to that stage and then if there's time at the end of this video I'm going to record, do a screen capture of me working in Photoshop, how I show you how I scan John, pop him into the thing and then we'll print it out and have a look at the result. And then in the next uh, video, part three, I'll be doing the other characters and at the end of part three we should end up with a finished double page spread with those characters in it. And there's still room for some more characters so keep watching this space. Okay, right, let's get on with the painting. Here we go. Okay, so here's one of my sketchbooks. This is numbered number three, but I think there's more than that, hundreds of sketches. Anyway, this is the actual sketch which is going, uh, which led to the cover of the book. Um, there's the cover on the right, and all of my 
uh, all the pictures in the book start with sort of exploratory sketches. Here I have uh, Squiggly Pete holding a tin of mushy peas, um, and I'm examining the way his hands fall and that sort of business. There are his uh, examining his gestures. So that's another one that's just inside the cover of the book. And there's the finished sketch. Once I've done that, then I will trace that and uh, ink it and colour it in. Now, <clears throat> the characters from the Red Lion. This is one of the ladies from the Red Lion and another one here. These are the, pen the original pencil sketches. I look at the photograph and I sort of draw from the photograph. And there's John. And that's the sketch I decided to use from the photograph. And the next stage is to make photocopies of those. So sometimes when I do the sketch, it's a little bit bigger or smaller than I want to use. So then I'll use the photocopier to reduce it or enlarge it to the size that I want to do the final watercolour painting. So these are the photocopies. And also I have to darken the photocopies a bit so that when I put it on the light box, uh, the light will shine through the paper. OK. So next up we've got my watercolour paper. I use this Daler and Rowney stuff, hot pressed. That means it's very smooth. You can have watercolour paper with lots of texture, which is great for doing sort of landscapes and things like that where you want texture. But in this case, I want to do nice ink drawings and then colour them in, as it were. So I want hot pressed, smooth paper. That's the stuff I use pretty much all of the time. OK, so the first thing I'll do is to get the photocopy and put it on my light box. You can see that it's a very slim thing. It's just a piece of perspex with lighting behind it, really. And uh, I'll line it all up and um, there's my watercolour paper on top. As you can see, you can just about see through it enough to trace. Um, so I'm just getting ready. And then what I'll do is, because I don't need a whole piece of watercolour paper, I'm just going to cut this one in half. There we go. My very handy little desk slidey uh, cutter thing. Very, very useful those. Highly recommend getting one of those if you do anything arty at all. OK, and so the next thing I'll do is to line up on the page, on the paper, where exactly I want to do the painting. And then I'll get a bit of high-tech paper fastener, otherwise known as sellotape, and just sellotape the two pieces together. That just stops it sort of skidding around on the surface when I'm drawing. There we go, a couple of pieces. And as you can see, now, interestingly, I've got my desk lamp on here at the same time. So you'll see, there we go, I've turned it off. I'm using a Stadler Norris HB number no. two pencil made in Germany. And I've been using these for decades. They're great, perfect. Little rubber tip at the end. And then, in fact, these pencils are actually featured in the book. If you look at uh, Squealy Pete's pockets or his hand, he's usually got one in his hand which it's hanging out of his pocket. OK, so the first thing I'll do is I'll then sort of just trace roughly the um, sketch that I've already drawn um, just to bring out the characteristics, the features, the way I want to ink it and so on. Just basically pick out the character a little bit more. See, when I did the first pencil sketch, I was just sort of exploring getting the dimensions right and, you know, placing it on the page and getting the gestures right. And there you can see I'm flipping between the desktop lamp and the lamp coming up from the light box. Um, sometimes you just want to check what's on the page. You have to turn the lamp, the light box off to do that. Here we go. So that's the penciling pretty much done. Um, OK. Down to the feet. There's John's feet. And there I've turned on the desk lamp again so you can see what's on top of the paper. I think I'm happy with that. So turn off the light box and now this is what you can see in the room with the desk lamp and there's my finished pencil sketch. Okay now ironically enough having sketched the thing in the first place first of all on just normal you know A4 sketching paper in a sketchbook and then making a photocopy and then tracing it and penciling it into a watercolour piece of watercolour paper the next thing I do is half rub it out. OK, and here's my ink. This is, well, in this case, I think Kandahar Black Indian ink. Um, I've also used Windsor and Newton Black Indian ink, which has got shellac in it, which makes it uh, waterproof. So once you've scribbled your ink down on the page, and then you come along and you use your watercolours, um, the watercolour won't dissolve the ink and it won't go all blurry. Now, there are times when you want that effect, but not in 
the case of the illustrations I'm doing at the moment. So I want a, a waterproof ink and I'm going to basically just go over these light pencil lines having so, so I've half scrubbed them out again and um, there we go just wipe away the dust rubber bits and then I'm ready to start inking. Now unfortunately sorry about this I forgot to video the inking of the whole thing so basically it's just it's just like going over it with an ink pen and if you're interested in details I'm using a Sainsbury's £3.99 uh, standard school fountain pen there. I used to use the scratchy pointy um, dip pens as they say as they used to call them um, but I found it was too scratchy and I found using a cartridge pen is really good. You have to dip it in the same way because you can't store the ink in a cartridge. Um, so you still have to dip it in your ink. But there you go. Right, here's my trusty watercolour box. A bit scruffy, sorry about that. It's a mixture. Originally this was a Winsor & Newton set of about 24 uh, little half pans, they call them. So each of those little squares is called a half pan. And they're fairly expensive, the Windsor and Newton ones, but I had some great talks with my local art shop and they gave me some great advice when I started out doing this sort of thing. And they recommended a, a brand called Sennelier watercolours. And to be honest, I've used them and I haven't gone back since. Um, they are absolutely great, really rich in colour. There you can see I've just rubbed out the final little bits of pencil mark that are still on the page. And just getting ready to mix up the paint and the first thing I always do is I always when I'm you know filling in these characters it's a bit like painting by numbers you know I've done so much of this that basically it's uh, like a little bit routine it's still fun and I still love the way the paint moves but um, I no longer have to work out what I'm going to do I just sort of dive in and the first thing I do is to do the flesh colours um, that helps to sort of bring the, the character to life. So I'm just giving my little paint box a bit of a clean up there. It's got still got paint left from the last session. Sorry I didn't get it all in the picture, but uh, you know my video skills will improve. So there I am, just pointing out. I'm going to do the face, the neck, and the arms, the flesh colours, and the colour I use to make up the flesh colour, depending on the character I'm doing, of course. Um, I always use that light yellow ochre. Now you can see it there at the bottom. I'm just dipping into it there. That's a full pan um, of paint. And the reason I've got a one full pan is because I use a lot of that. It's a lovely, lovely, rich yellow, well, ochre color. And I use it for Squiggly Pete's leathery jacket collar and cuffs and things like that. And Lucy Lou's boots and other bits and pieces, for swords and shiny brass things. But it's also a great base for the, the flesh color. Um, so I use a fair amount of that and then a little dab of the bright red there, which is called Windsor Red. Uh, I think this Windsor Red just because it's Windsor and Newton and it's their own specific sort of type of red or one of their reds. Obviously these companies have like about a couple of dozen types of red and a couple of dozen types of yellow. Anyway, that's Windsor Red and it's powerful stuff so you need a tiny dab and I'm sorry but just off screen I'm mixing that together. Uh, you'll see the colour in a minute. Um, it's a sort of flesh, sort of a light tan colour. Here we go. I always just do a little dab here and there on the paper just to check I've got it right. Obviously it looks like I have. So the first thing I do is now add a little bit of water and just start to colour it in. Like I said, it's a bit like paint by numbers. Um, maybe if I if I get well, if I get time sooner or later, I could do a little book, a little book how to paint. How to paint with Martin Harvey. Yes. In fact, I've thought about this and I, I think, just like Delia Smith years ago, um, I think she brought out a cookbook saying how to boil an egg. So I think I shall call my book How to Sharpen a Pencil. There we go. Okay, so the first thing I do is just lay down a little bit of colour and let that dry for a couple of minutes. Then I'll come back with a denser version of the same colour, yellow oak and Windsor red. Um, to add some shadows and this is where the character starts to come to life um, you know you start to sculpt the face as you can see I've left the cheekbones light there um, which immediately gives shape to the face I'll put the shadows in the neck can you see how it's starting to look more three-dimensional already it's quite easy right hang on a minute just checking my phone that's gone off there we go and then a few little dabs here and there, shadows around the eyes, to deep, deep in the eye sockets and so on.
And now, in fact, I've actually dried off the brush and I'm soaking some of that paint off. I think I might have put a little bit too much on here and there. So this is the nice thing about watercolours. Um, it doesn't dry straight away. And if you make a mistake and you know how to do it, you can correct it. Not that it's a mistake, it's just, you know, taste. Anyway, so there you can see. It's already Andy, uh, John from the Red Line, starting to take shape. And I think next I'm going to paint in his clothes. Now, oddly enough, this is one of the things I really enjoy about doing watercolours and, and my characters, as well as doing the facial features and, you know, their gestures and stuff. <clears throat> I also enjoy painting their clothes because it's, a, it's an opportunity to just, like, mess around with the paint and see how the water and the pigment work together and flow. And you can make them, you can use blurry effects or you can use sharp um, outline effects. I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so I'm just going to put down the colour of John's jeans there. Nice denim, which I'm using, I think it's Windsor Blue. Again, I think that's a proprietary name for a Windsor brand type of blue, sort of a turquoise blue, nice. And that's just the, the base layer. And I'm going to add in some darker paint blue to, um, to give it shadows, <clears throat> to give it shape. And can you see the paint flows nicely from one one colour into another? You've got to work quite quickly. Well, you've got to work very quickly with watercolours most of the time because it dries very quickly. If you've ever tried, I thought I could sort of paint outside in the summer. It's much, much too hot. It dries instantly and you just can't get the effects you want. So you see on the left leg, or rather his right, our left, the paint has flowed nicely from the light blue, the dark blue into the light blue. But on the right leg, can you see the sharper outlines of the shadows? Um, and that's because the under the undercoat, the light blue, dried uh, very, very quickly. So you can see the different effects there. So now I'm just adding a little bit of water back in, just to let it flow, just let it flow away again and blur. So it gives a nice soft finish. Now, if he was wearing smart pinstripe trousers with a nice crease down the front, then I'd probably do the same sort of thing in grey, <clears throat> um, but wait till the first layer had dried and then put on the second layer, which would give a nice sharp crease down the middle. But of course, we don't want that here. This is jeans, nice and casual. There we go. And one of the things I find interesting is when you look at paintings, you know, done by a proper artist, you think, wow, how do they paint clothes? you know, so they look so realistic, they flow and stuff. In fact, they're little tricks, <clears throat> little tricks. You know, you let the you let the observer's eye fill in the details. You sort of suggest, you suggest the details. You, you know, I've suggested the shadows there. I haven't drawn every little crease. I haven't drawn every little sti stitch. You just get the sort of, the way the colours and the light changes. Now, if you look on the, on his right leg, our left, I've left it white all down one side. And that's because I like to leave highlights, um, you know, it adds some light. If you look at any object, there's always re reflections of light on it. Um, and uh, this helps to make the thing three-dimensional, give it some sort of reality, if you like. Not that you want it to be too realistic. Anyway, so to do John's T-shirt, which is grey, basically, I'm using a lovely colour, one of my lovely favourite watercolours. It's called Payne's Grey. And depending on how thickly you apply it, you can get either a lovely light grey wash or an almost jet black, um, you know, dark black. But there's little elements of blue in it. If you look closely, if, probably if you looked under the microscope, you'd see little dots of blue and other colours in it. It's a lovely, lovely mixture. And it's not just plain flat grey, it's got a character of its own. Payne's grey, they call it. One of my favourites. Here we are, you see, I'm just put quite a lot more on my brush, you know, the, the, the raw paint. So rather than mix with water, I've almost got the raw paint there. And just dabbing it around to give shadows and definition to the shape. Okay, so I've picked out our right-hand side, his left. The light is obviously coming from the left in this case, um, which is where the mushy peas are, actually, off to the left. Um, so that's the way I, you know, I use the light to dramatise uh, the illustration. A bit like Caravaggio and his chiaroscuro, or whatever it was back in the what, 16th, 15th, 16th century. 
I don't know, a uh, long time ago, but they decided to use light and dark, and it was a revolution at the time. Now we just do it automatically. Look at that. This is one of the reasons I love watercolour. It's so simple. There's no elaborate sort of mixing up of solution and, you know, laying out thick layers like oil paint and stuff. Although I do want to paint in oil sometime. I love watercolour. It's It feels so organic, so, so natural, the way the water and the paint combine. And you can use it to create shape. So there you go. So there we've got uh, John, almost three-dimensional. Almost lifelike, dare I say it. I mean, this is one of the things I really enjoy about my painting and drawing. I have an idea for a character, well, you know, normally an abstract character, and I'm, I draw the eyes and they come to life, the nose and the mouth, and then they become a character. And then you put their clothes in and sort of, you know, it, it sort of brings them to life. In this case, obviously, we're using a real person. And the challenge here is to take a real person and turn them into a cartoon character. Um, but can you see how, with like a few simple techniques, you can create light and dark, shadow, depth, you know, humour, got a lovely smile there, the gesture, which I've just taken from the actual gesture that the guys did in the street. Um, and that was very helpful, you know, because otherwise I'd be standing there trying to work out the gesture on my own. But if you just take a quick photo and say, oh yes, that hand goes up there, that one's hanging down this side. Of course, you make the eyes go where you want the viewer to look. So in this case, the mushy peas will be coming down from the top left of the page. So that's where he's looking. OK, add a little bit more depth here to put the shadow of the T-shirt flopping around with the brisk motion. A little bit of shadow there. It's nearly done. A bit more shadow around the jawline. Now, what am I doing now? I'm mixing up some brown by the look of it. My brown, and I say, ah, you can see my abbreviations there. I make abbreviations in the in the watercolor box, so I can remember which paints to buy next time. So, at the bottom, from the left, we've got sap which is sap green, olive green there, light yellow ochre, normal yellow ochre, Y-O, RS, which is raw sienna, BS, burnt sienna, raw umber, burnt umber, and indigo. And then we've got the Payne's grey out of the edge of your screen there. Oh, looks like I've finished. Happy with that. It didn't take long, did it? Right, I think it takes about 10 times as long to make these videos as it does to actually do the pictures. Right, now, what I'm adding here is a little bit of bright green down the edge towards the light. That's because we've got this big flash of um, luminous zombie mushy peas flying through the air in Parkgate. Um, so to make the, the character join in with a scene, so it just doesn't look like you've just drawn something and plopped it on there, I'm using the light from the, from the mushy peas reflected on those light bits. You see, there was a reason I left those in the first place. Okay, there we go. A thousand and one little tiny details all add up. I mean, you could do this in one big, big picture, but the problem is if you get it wrong, you've got to scrub things out. And sometimes with watercolours, it's not always easy to correct things. So the way I do it is I just do the backgrounds and then do the characters and okay. scan them. In. So there we've seen the um, <clears throat> drawing, photocopying, tracing, inking and painting of John from the red line in Parkgate. There's the finished thing um, up on my screen. For reference while I'm working, I have the original photo. And there we have the two of them together. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, it doesn't look exactly like John. Uh, it's not supposed to be. The character is the inspiration for the picture and a reference to that person. And um, yeah, I hope he's going to like it. Thanks, John. OK, so here we are. I've got Photoshop open, and this is the double page spread with the um, artwork for um, Squiggly Pete and the crew outside the first and last pub. 
and the bats flying everywhere and the mushy peas raining down from above. Now the first thing we need to do is to import our painted picture of John from the red line into the picture. So here we go. The first thing I do is fire up my scanning software. I'm using a Canon um, all-in-one inkjet here and it comes with this software. It says I've run out of space but I haven't quite. Now, so I'm going to do a preview. You hear the scanner whizzing away there. And there's our picture under the scanner lens and a piece of cardboard I've put behind it and some heavy books to keep it down nice and flat so we don't get any wrinkles in the paper. And I'm going to select this area um, here. There we go. And by default it gives it that sort of setting. I've got a set of settings set up here which I use for scanning in my paintings which enhances the colour, well it doesn't enhance the colour, it just scans them as they're more like, you know, more like as they were painted. So there we go, uh, all the settings here are okay, I'm scanning it at 300 dpi which is what I work with and watch what most printers require, you know, the resolution they require. Okay, so there's our preview, scan and off we go. It takes a second, the scanner to whiz across that do its thing, import all the little digital bits and there it is in my folder which I've got set up for the scanning of these things and as you can see I've got hundreds and hundreds of pictures in here covering every part of the book plenty of stuff there okay so we go back to our picture I'm going to give it a name I'm going to call it John from the Red Lion and then I'm going to say, OK, let's open that up with Photoshop. And if we give a second to do its thing now. There we go. There's our picture in Photoshop. Now, I know a lot of you who aren't familiar with uh, scanning software and um, computers so much, I think, how do you do this sort of thing? How, how does this work? Well, the computer scanned in the picture here. That's exactly as it was in the watercolour. And if you look closely, you can even see the texture of the watercolour paper there. It's great fun. It, it captures the things in great detail. Every little stroke, every little bit of watercolour paint. So what you need to do is digitally cut it out. It's just like working in the real world with sellotape and paper and glue and whatever you have. So you have tools. In Photoshop there's a tool called a lasso, so if I hit my shortcut you can see a little lasso there. I'm going to lasso John, whoops, because I don't want all the background blobs and bits of paint and things on here. I'm just going to add that bit in there, right over there. So that's it. So I'm going to then have a keyboard shortcut, copy and paste, and I've got a second John, just like that. OK, now what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to zoom in a bit over here. I'm going to expand that so you can see what I'm doing. Now he's got a white, he's got some white paper all around him, yeah? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get a random dark colour like this. I'm going to create a rectangle behind that. And then just put it down behind so we can see John cut out there with all the white stuff around. Now we don't need the white stuff so we'll use another tool to delete all of that. I've got a magic a magic selector tool here. It's a shortcut W um, for wizard or something like that I think in Photoshop. And all you have to do is click on it. I've got my settings set to a tolerance of 30. Probably only need about say 15 here. And click on that. And can you see it's highlighted all the white so I could just delete that. The only problem is there are some bits of white which I want to keep. So like like here. So I'm going to use my lasso tool again and say oops, wrong way. Say right, I want to keep that little bit there. Because otherwise you'd have holes and uh, John would appear on the screen with sort of holes and all you'd see was mushy peas and the night sky through him. You don't want that. So fairly detailed work and this is this is one of the things this is one of the reasons why this you know this book or any book or thing you're working on such as this can take so long because 
this is careful detailed work at the end of the day and it has to be done. There are some shortcuts and the more you do it the better you get. For example if I zoom in here I can delete all those pixels here, that bit we don't need. Um, I'm just doing this quickly to show you how it all works. So there we are, I've selected most of that. I'm going to use my wizardy W tool again and um, just have a quick check, see if the, make sure there's no other holes left there that and that looks to me okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say select the inverse of that copy and paste again hey then we've got John there that the white background okay so I'm going to save that a minute while I'm working and I'm going to call it John from the lion underscore isolated 01a. I have a numbering system for all my files so I don't lose them and I know what version I'm working with. Okie dokie, so there we go. There's John. And all you have to do is drag him like this boop, and pop him into the scene. How easy is that? How fun! So there's John, look, looking up at the sky. Let's make that full screen so we can see it a little bit or close up. Now, I don't mind telling you, this is the first time I'm actually sharing this with you. Uh, I haven't done this before. I mean, I haven't done this character before. I've um, just added it into the video here for fun. Um, but as you can see, John's looking like a bit of a giant compared to the other characters. Obviously, I've made Squiggly Pete, Lucy and Jack big because they're the main characters. I've got other characters over here such as this little chap who's called Fishfinger Fred. I'll just give you a close-up on Fishfinger Fred there. Who appears in another book I'm working on called Parkgate's Pottiest Pirates. Um, yeah, he's a rather unfortunate character. He he's a he's a chef, works at a local restaurant. Um, and he, you know, he catches his own fish and uh, chops it up and um, you know cooks with it. And his fingers always smell of fish. Unfortunately, yeah, that's why he's called Fishfinger Fred. Anyway, more about that in another video because I'm. Um, I'm writing some poems and stories around other characters like Fishfinger Fred and so on. Anyway, so here we have John, and I'm going to give him a name. Give this part of the Photoshop file a name. I name all the bits. You see, you've got all sorts of bits and pieces here. You've got the backgrounds, the characters, the rats, and so on. I'm going to say John Orridge. That's my shortcut for original. And I'm going to copy that. So I've got a backup copy if things go wrong. Well, I'll just show you. I'll go back to my thing. See, I've got two Johns now. Right, I'm going to hide that one. We don't need that, we don't need two. But if everything goes wrong and I need to sort of redo this, you see, I can just go back and start again. So while I'm here, uh, disk is full. Right, that's a bit of a problem because my computer is running out of space. Right, I'm just gonna quickly finish this demo. Let's bring John here down to a size more comparable to Fishfinger Fred. There we are. This is where we're going to have him. Outside the pub there, maybe standing next to Fishfinger Fred. That looks good, I like that. And we're going to have the other characters, the ladies from the bar, in here as well. So there you go. It's as simple as that. Great fun, isn't it? So that's how we incorporate our characters into the double page spread. And as I said, keep watching these videos because I'm going to be talking about how you can get involved in two. I'm looking, I'm looking for some more characters to put into this book. Um, and I'll be giving you details about that soon. Okay, so there's John, manager of the Red Lion pub, standing outside with Fit, um, Fishfinger Fred, a fictitious character, Squiggly Pete and the crew. Great stuff. Thanks for watching. My name is Squiggly Peter, and I love my fish and chips. I love that salt and vinegar, what dribbles down me lips. And when I'm out there pirating, my pencil in my hand, I draw myself whatever I need or whatever comes to hand. Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete, Squiggly Pete are the pirate.